fellow marketers. This episode is brought to you by Quick. It is a auto transcription service. And actually this episode was transcribed in only minutes by this amazing service that we here at FSM use all the time. We're gonna talk about it more later in the video, but check it out when you do have a minute. All right, Film School for Marketers, welcome back to episode number 36 of our FSM podcasts. I'm joined as always by Miss Mariah Anderson. And today we have an awesome guest. He is a veteran in the podcasting world. He is the author of Marketing Now, Mr. David Bain. David, how's it going? It's going very well. How's it going with you, Will? Good. Uh, I'm excited for this conversation, to be honest. I was I was yeah. brushing through a lot of your other content. You are an absolute veteran when it comes to making podcasts and video podcasts. You sort of dip your toes in a lot of different places. So it's not hard to find you when somebody wants to go Google who David Bain is online, which is, it makes my job a lot easier. You make me want to um, think that I'm going to retire soon. Hopefully not, <laughs> <laughs> not soon. <laughs> Well, I'm told anyway, it only it only gets easier with time. So hopefully the, <laughs> the ball will continue to keep rolling down the hill for both of us. Uh, David, for the people that don't know you, can we just start off with a bit of a background of your history, when you got started creating content online and um, what you're doing today? Wow. Yeah, sure. So th- thanks again for having me, Will. Um, yeah, good to meet you, Mariah, as well. We um, I've been around for a long time online. I actually launched my first business in the year 2000. I recorded my first podcast in 2006, uh, published the first YouTube video in 2007. And since then, I guess I've had um, phases where I've been quite focused on publishing a lot of content. The podcast that I've probably published most and um, been most um, predictable at publishing ex- uh, episodes on have been has been digital marketing radio in the past and I published over 200 episodes of that but that's been on pause for a little bit um, while I've focused on the book marketing now so be prepared for a new podcast coming fairly soon that's awesome to hear a little taste of that is coming in this episode, I'm sure. So <laughs> David, I've gotten to talk to you a couple times now, and I think you have such an interesting way of categorizing making content online and, and doing it successfully. So I, what I want this episode to be about is understanding how to balance different types of content that you should be creating and how they work together and sort of the trade-offs of, of where you're investing your time and money when it comes to creating content online. And then we're video people here, so I'm going to be continuing to poke holes in what does this really mean for the video marketer and the marketing director that listens to our podcasts, trying to understand how to invest the right amount of time and effort with video. So David, before we go too far into this episode, I want everyone to have a good understanding of what you call the four H's of content on online. Can you dive into that that thought process and, and tell a little a bit more about the philosophy of the four H's? Yeah, sure. Sounds great. So Back in about 2007 or so, when I'd already been a bit successful online, I started doing training programs. So internet marketing was called back then. You didn't call it digital marketing, but that's another story. <laughs> and what I got in terms of feedback was, uh, that's great. That's a lot of information, but um, what's the structure behind it? How do we actually implement everything you've taught us there? And it, it took me a long time to really come up with a, a structure that I believe that you can apply to almost any digital marketing activity, any selection of different digital marketing activities, because it, it's so tough nowadays. Even if you look five years ago or so, and you looked at the way, for instance, MarTech has evolved. Uh, marketing technology, there used to be maybe 100, 200 pieces of technology you could choose from. Now there's 7,000, 8,000. And it just shows you that as a marketer, you can't know everything about mm-hmm. technology and the different digital channels that you can focus on. You need some kind of model that that will help you tie things together. So when you encompass new things, then the, you know where it actually fits into your overall model. Um, so I thought to myself, well, what's at the, the center of any successful digital marketing campaign? And to me, and the more I thought about it, it's content. It's content, even if you're talking about paid 
digital marketing activities. Uh, if you're talking about th- something as simple as a paid ad, having a strong call to action in there, great copy on there, a landing page. Um, so that great content um, oscillates around paid content as it does organic content. Then I, so then I went hunting for content marketing models out there. And there are some good models. And a model that I came across was the 3H model uh, by Google. And that's the way that they advocated content to be considered for YouTube at the time, about five years ago. And the 3Hs are, of course, hub content, help content, which was originally called hygiene content, and um, hero content. And those 3Hs are a wonderful way to go about framing the content that you produce. But to me, as a digital marketer, as someone who also focused on calls to action on a web page, on landing page content, and getting conversion rates up, I didn't think there was enough of an emphasis on how to actually convert visitors from your primary landing page. So I came up with a a fourth H. I called that heart content, the the heart of what a business does. And that describes landing page content, the type of content that you would use to describe your core product or service or or whatever product pages you wanted to design. So then you're left with your four H's, your your hero content, which is all about just incredible quality content that, that people will absolutely love with, they'll engage with, they'll share socially. You've got your hub content, which is your more episodic content. And that could be on a blog. It could be a YouTube series. It could be a podcast. You've got your help content, which is wonderful answering questions type content. Great. Um, you ask the answer type content. And then you've got the heart content then, which is your your landing page type content, your, your core call to action type content. So there we go. That's the summary of what I call the four H's. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's really amazing, and I I think this is so interesting for me because we're obviously very heavy into the philosophy of they ask you answer, and mm-hmm. and so it's it's always interesting to have this this mindset of taking three big steps back from the strategy of that they ask you answer teaches people and think, okay, I'm I'm obsessing over my customers' questions. I understand that the internet is this repository of all of this information that's only giving buyers more power to just have information before they actually have to reach out to organizations and ask themselves or make themselves known. But there's an interesting devil's advocate to play in there that says there's so much more beyond just obsessing over your customers' questions. How does they ask you answer fit into an even larger picture or spectrum of what a content marketing strategy should really include? And so you said the help content seems to fit that that category so well. And, and then you think of like hub content where it's a lot, it's pretty much what we're doing here where we have people that now know our organization and they, they, they trust us and they like us and they trust us and they like us from our hero content and our help content. And now they're just trying to find more to consume essentially. And so I'm curious what you think when you, when you're categorizing those out, um, where where does it make sense for people to start? Something tells me it's not hub content. People shouldn't go out and make a podcast to to start their content marketing strategy. Yeah, and I struggled with that for a long time, to be honest with you, because I probably suffer from the same thing as, as many digital marketers suffer from, and that is um, a love of, of shiny new technologies rather than what a customer is doing. And, and thinking about it impassionately, I think that the best way for any training program, any digital marketing strategy to start with is the customer journey. Mm. And there's a good standard model that you can use, something along the lines of attract, convince, convert, and maybe delight on the end to encourage ambassadors as well. Um, So the help type content that you were talking about there, um, where you'd be focusing in on the questions, to me, is the convinced stage. You've got attract content, which um, is possibly uh, hero content. So incredible one-off pieces of content that will actually attract people to your brand to begin with. But after that, after they know who you are as a brand, you want to actually tell them a little bit about you as a business and what products and services that you offer so that um, when they are in the market to buy something, when they're ready to make a purchase, then it's you that they'll search for. It's you that they'll, 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 they'll turn to after that stage. So the convinced stage to me is the help type content where you're really good at focusing in, in on those questions. And of course you can do that 
as blog content on your website or as great question type videos as well on YouTube or other places? I know I interact with businesses initially, almost always with help content before anything else, unless it's just something that's aesthetically pleasing in the hero content. I, I, I need to trust the business. I need to like the, the, the people or the organization that's creating the content before I really care about anything else. Because the what's in it for me question as a buyer is always in the back of my head saying, why should I really care about what I'm learning here? And when it's not black and white value, I'm getting out of the content itself. I don't, it's, it becomes more cloudy or, or there's bigger gray area. And, and what I'm really getting out of this, this piece of information, unless it's like a funny commercial or, or something similar to that. So I, I believe that it still makes sense to start with that help content when, you, when you're starting your content marketing strategy. The first question I ask is, how do I add value to the lives of, of the people that are going to be consuming my content? And then how do I make them like me and trust me for doing so? And, and then for me, I, I start to think about that hero content as being the, the next sort of beneficial thing for a business to do. And I'm wondering, David, what you think people can do out of the gates to start to dip their toes in that hero content, particularly if they're a mid-sized business that may or may not have a huge budget to go spend on, on hero content. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, actually, um, you're saying that, um, in your opinion, hero content fits after help. Um, to, be, to be honest with you, there's, there's no correct answer, I, I, I feel. Um, and obviously, customers will engage with the content that they want to engage with, and they're going to take the journey that they want to take as well. It may be even the case that you have actually um, been introduced to a brand as a result of some piece of uh, hero content, uh, and then you've decided to engage with them in the help content and not even remember remembering the fact that actually you're introduced to this brand through this other piece of content to begin with. Um, but um, yeah, different types of content um, can can work in, in, in different ways. But you, you, your question about um, how do you actually go about producing this type of hero content and what's right for each business? Um, different things are right for different businesses and hero content is not necessarily the same for all businesses. I've seen some wonderful, for instance, TV adverts, which are only one minute long, but have uh, had so much money spent on them are so funny and incredible and different and um, have had actors uh, almost making a mini um, documentary out of them that they become little pieces of hero content in themselves. So that could in effect be a piece of hero content if it's really shared online and people love it. Uh, another piece of hero content could be uh, someone choosing to make a documentary film instead of um, just a um, an interview discussion or some easier piece of content to produce. They could actually uh, have spent um, weeks, months on producing a special documentary film on the overarching subject matter area that a business happens to to, to sit in. Um, so that, that can be a wonderful introduction to, 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 to a brand, certainly. Uh, and of course, it's, it can be video. It doesn't necessarily have to be video. It could be something as crazy as having a book, uh, not even a piece of digital content. Um, someone finding out, a, out out about a brand because they discover a book on Amazon and then discover the brand through that and then perhaps opt into someone's uh, email list after that. In terms of quality of video in these 4-Hs, what are your thoughts on quality helping or hurting an organization? Should it just be about creating video content um, or should quality be a big factor as well to be successful? I think you'll get different perspectives on this. I mean, to me, there has to be um, a minimum be benchmark in terms of quality. Uh, a lot of people say, just get going in terms of content production. A lot of people say, all you have to do is have an iPhone now and start publishing one minute pieces of content and publish them on Facebook and that'll be more natural and people will engage. Yes, th there's an argument to say that that will work as well. But as long as if you can be heard, as long as you've, you've decent audio quality and you can be seen 
as well. Uh, it's funny, uh, back in <laughs> 2007, when I um, published my first video on YouTube, it was actually in 320 pixel wide resolution. And that, that was a standard resolution at the time, but obviously it's gone up to 640 <laughs> and then 720 and then 1080 and, and, and 4K now. I think, I think generally now, your know, HD um, 1080 pixels is, is completely fine in terms of video quality. You, you want to make sure that things like lighting are, are okay. Hey, obviously you, you, you're lit very well. Your, your, your backgrounds are wonderful as well, but it's not just about the visual. It's about the quality of the sound um, as well. Um, Mariah, I love your uh, ATR 2100 microphone you've got there. It's, it's a great staple of microphone and it, it only costs something like 50 to $70 to get. Um, and it's, it's an absolutely superb microphone it gives, gives great quality audio. Um, so you don't, necessarily need to pay the earth to have decent quality audio. Um, the great thing about that particular microphone is it's got two connections to a computer. It's got an XLR cable, which is more of a professional connection, and it's also got a USB connection as well, so anyone can connect it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a big um, believer in having to have decent audio quality first, um, because as we uh, discussed just before um, recording this, um, audio quality is, is key to video success. And um, a lot of people, viewers, will uh, start a video, then walk away and just consume it just by listening to it rather than uh, watching the whole thing. But of course, if you're going to get a decent microphone, um, like the one you've got there, you know, I've, I've got a, a fairly similar microphone in terms of it's a dynamic microphone, you've got to know how to use it. So you've got to be able to talk around the microphone. You can't go too far away from the microphone, otherwise um, you're not really going to be picked up there. You, you get other um, USB condenser microphones where you can have, for instance, on your desk further away from you, but I, I don't particularly like them because um, they do pick up a lot of noise from other places in the room as well. The, the, they're great for amateurs because it means that you don't have to think about the microphone. But I would say if, if you're going to do a similar kind of broadcast to this, get a decent dynamic microphone and get comfortable with having the microphone three or four inches away from you and, and talking around the microphone. As we mentioned earlier, this episode is sponsored by Quick. If you haven't heard of Quick, here's what it does. It allows anyone in your organization to quickly generate open captions for your videos. That means captions that are always there no matter where your viewers are watching. Video ads, social media, they're always visible. They're going to stop the scroll and they're going to cater to all of your viewers. Let's be honest, organic reach on social is getting increasingly difficult. And if you're running paid ads, you need to generate an ROI. Quick is going to help you do just that. It uses AI to generate your captions in just a few minutes. And it's very inexpensive with plans starting as low as $12 a month. Quick has saved marketers and videographers like you over 400,000 minutes of time. So believe me, they are worth checking out. Visit quick.io to try out Quick today. So David, I'm sure a lot of marketing directors and, and business owners come to you and ask the question of like, how do I get started or where, where do I go first with my, with my content? And you said it yourself, it's very different answer for every business. I'm wondering what you ask businesses or what you think business owners or marketing directors should be asking themselves to say, um, how do I know what to do first within content marketing strategy? And how do I know how to deliver this to my prospects? Like what are those questions that business owners should be asking themselves to start this the right way for, for their own organization and their own industry? It's, it is a really tough one. I guess the first question is, do you believe in content marketing? <laughs> because a lot of businesses don't believe in that because um, it's not the medium necessarily where they can have the immediate um, measurable um, result um, directly from that. And obviously things are getting better. Um, you can start to measure things like you know, click-throughs from different videos as well and um, see how people are directly converting from that. But many content marketing efforts aren't intended to result in an immediate call to action. And it's generally accepted that best practice today is getting out content that will resonate with your target market, but, but not um, necessarily result in an immediate sale. So it's, it's, it's tracking that. And you're not going to be able to track that every time. Um, so hopefully... Um, to begin with, um, you're talking to a business owner that um, understands the value of content marketing, understands that there are different stages in the customer journey. So I, I would initially get to know 
an individual business's uh, customer journey and and each customer journey is slightly different and then get them to agree um, the types of content that um, their average customer is more likely to resonate with at each stage in the in the journey I think it's like a sales process um, you're kind of locking in different aspects of first of all yeah do you agree that this is your customer journey secondly do you agree that this is what matters to them and you know is important for them at, at these different stages and then it's a case of uh, understanding the different channels that are right for them at, at each stage of, of, of that um, customer journey or the, the types of content they're experiencing. I think the biggest egg to crack that you just touched on right there is, is understanding how well you know your own customer and your own qualified prospect. You want to know who they are and how they educate themselves and how they want to be interacted with in a way that is going to meet them at the medium that they want to be met with. And a lot of times that just comes to bring it back down to an individual. Like, who do you really want to be talking to that's qualified online? Because if you're not going for exposure or reach with your content, you should be making very pointed pieces of information. Otherwise, you're going to be making that's something for everyone, which means it's probably something for, for no one at the end of the day if it's not pointed enough. Absolutely. And the information's out there now. In order to create that bespoke content, you just have to look at at something as simple as Google suggests uh, at the bottom of different search results. And Google will tell you other long phrases that people are actually searching for and related to that keyword phrase. So it's not a challenge to come up with the types of content that you should be writing. Um, it's probably the bigger challenge is, I guess, convincing your boss that you need to do it and then writing the content or recording the video that you need to do. So David, I want to ask you a question because I think you've seen a lot of businesses try and fail at this in the past or, or not have the longevity required to actually show value on content marketing. What are the common pitfalls that you see businesses do or the problems that they find early in when they're starting that help content and when they're starting to create they ask you answer-esque content online? Specifically, I would say that businesses are probably targeting the wrong questions or not delivering a high quality enough piece of content in order to be able to drive organic traffic from those questions. You know, many years ago, you used to have um, uh, a lot less competition. Uh, if we look at um, Google Organic as an example, um, you could rank for certain keyword phrases a lot easier than you could. And obviously, this can be applied to YouTube as well. Nowadays, uh, not only do you have to be very specific in terms of the keyword phrase that you're trying to rank for, the question that you're trying to rank for, you have to be producing a piece of content that's better than content that exists already. So I don't think enough time and effort uh, goes into researching what should be in the piece of content, what other content exists already, how your piece of content can be better than, than other pieces of content out there. If you don't just make your content a little bit better, um, then you can get a whole lot more traffic. I remember a couple of years ago doing some research um, on the keyword phrase, how to tie a tie on YouTube. There are actually many videos that have had over a million views for that particular keyword phrase. Um, but there are a couple of videos on there and um, the ratings aren't that high. You're, you're talking about having 30% thumbs down, which is, which is, which is a, a poor percentage to have. Um, you, you need to be looking at, um, in my opinion, at least 90%, 95% um, positive ratings in order to um, demonstrate that you, you've got a really decent video out there. And in order to make your content better than other content that I that is out there. You just have to do something as simple as looking at other pieces of content, looking at the comments that they've got uh, and seeing what uh, issues people have with the pieces of content that exists. The content that I was looking at, how to tie a tie content, um, people had issues with the fact that the video was mirrored or the video was too fast. And videos were getting that kind of feedback within the comments there. So all you had to do was research what already existed, look at, looked at the comments, produce something better, and then that would give you so much of a, a, a better opportunity. So that can be applied to written content, as I say, to, to, to video content. For written content, you want to be having a look at, um, obviously, the Google search listings, have a look in Google answer boxes, and then having a look at things like the, the quantity of words, um, how articles are split down into different sections, 
uh, and also um, how many images are in there and what subheadings are in there and the kind of coding um, that is within pages. Um, uh, there, there are so many different elements to that. You can look at things like listing elements, for example. Uh, one great way to try to get into the Google Suggest box is to uh, include some kind of list within your answer. Uh, and then if you include a list in your blog post, but you're not actually marking it up using HTML code and showing Google it's a list, then you're making it tough on yourself and it's not as likely uh, that you're going to be ranking high and, and getting that answer box listing. Speaking of pitfalls and then tactics and things that can be done, can we talk a little bit about the heart content um, and maybe some of the pitfalls that you see hurt people and then maybe some things that really do help people in terms of conversions on those pages? Absolutely. Uh, now, in terms of um, the landing page content, I think the best model that I've seen for that is actually based upon Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. And if you have a look at the, the best landing pages out there, the kind of landing pages that are always being marketed for keyword phrases that are maybe $50 or more per click, you know those landing pages work because mm -hmm. it's quite costly to get that traffic. Um, so you look at maybe finance type keyword phrases, mortgage type keyword phrases, maybe accounting software keyword phrases. They do a wonderful job with their landing pages. And they all start with um, the why, the reason why they exist as a product before moving on to, to how it works and explaining in detail what they actually do as a business and um, what you can experience by getting the product. Uh, a lot of digital marketers are quite fact-driven and they make the mistake of being very what driven with mm. their landing page content to begin with, but you have to be emotional to, be, to begin with, to, to attract people initially, to, to drive people down the page. Have you seen um, video play a significant role in terms of an increase in conversion rates by including them? Definitely. Um, you know, I've, um, you know, I haven't done a whole lot of testing myself, but it's, it's so, so important to actually do something like split testing a landing page. Mm -hmm. um, you can have the, just the video above the fold and maybe a heading above it and the call to action button straight away. And then you can have written content underneath that as well. Um, but I've you know, heard, heard lots of stories of landing page content that's uh, that's converted a lot better by just having the written con, just having the the video content, content sorry, um, on there. So it's absolutely you want to do that. Um, I guess what you could do to begin with is is come up with the the written copy to begin with. Have your landing page up there, then use that as the basis to form your video. Um, once you've you're, you're you're comfortable that your your landing page is actually profitable and making you money. Um, um, then try it out in vi video form, split test that as well. But um, with landing page content, it's it's all about conversion rates. And if you can mm -hmm. increase those conversion rates by, by 5%, then that could be worth a lot of money. Well, this has been an amazing episode, David. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of your knowledge. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do so? Oh, thanks so much for having me on. It was great to be on with you. Uh, I, a couple of months ago, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to register davidbain.com. So I've, I've awesome. got that domain name now. It took me a whole lot of time to, to get that. <laughs> so I'm hanging on to it now. So that, that, um, that, that is my key website now, or it's going to be my key website. So I guess it's the only call to action to leave people. There we go. So we'll make sure to include that in the show notes. Uh, and obviously we will also include your book and your podcast for people to check out. There's tons of information that you can educate yourself and learn even more. Uh, and if you loved this episode, make sure to show it, give us a like, comment if you have any questions, let us know your thoughts, subscribe if you haven't and you would like to stay up to date with what we have going on. And we will see you next time.